In 1833, an English economist, William Forrester Lloyd, published a pamphlet which included an example of how common resources can be destroyed by overuse. In 1968, an ecologist, Gareth Hardin, influenced by this pamphlet, wrote a paper called The Tragedy of the Commons. Hardin was a respected ecologist, but the tragedy of the commons wasn't an ecological study. In fact, there was nothing in the piece that had not been discussed earlier by fisheries economists. Hardin's genius was not in discovering this issue. It was in communicating the concept in a captivating story and giving it a memorable name. The term, the tragedy of the commons, is one of those terms that escaped from academia and took on a life of its own, an idea that most of us are familiar with today. In his paper, Hardin asked his readers to imagine a common pasture land that's owned by everyone and by no one all at once. It's available to anyone to graze livestock on. Now consider the incentives faced by people bringing animals to feed. Each additional cow brought to the pasture represents pure profit for its owner. But the commons can't sustain an infinite number of cows. At some stage it will be overgrazed and the entire ecosystem will fail. That cost is not borne by any individual, but by society as a whole. Hardin went on to demonstrate that this type of incentive leads inescapably to ecological disaster and the collapse of the commons. He didn't use the word tragedy to mean an unfortunate outcome. He instead used it as Aristotle did, meaning a dramatic outcome that's the inevitable but unplanned result of a character's actions. Freedom in a commons brings ruin to all, according to Hardin. Hardin's assumption is that the herdsmen are unable to change their behaviour even in the face of certain disaster. But in the real world, small farmers, fishermen and others have created their own institutions and rules for preserving resources and ensuring survival through good years and bad. In his essay, Hardin explained that the commons either needed to be nationalised and managed by the government or privatised and handed out to individual farmers who would then look after their own land responsibly. There were no other solutions. The theory behind this is of course quite appealing to anyone with a background in economics. Now in 1968, Lynn Ostrom, who had just completed her PhD studying the management of fresh water in Los Angeles a few years earlier, attended one of Hardin's lectures. When she heard him speak, she realised that she had been studying the tragedy of the commons all along. But in her research, she had come to a very different conclusion. Ostrom, based upon her research, did not believe that the tragedy in such situations was inevitable. Her research showed that if the herders decided to cooperate with one another, monitoring each other's use of the land and enforcing rules for managing it, they could avoid the tragedy. In her research on managing water in Los Angeles, she had observed hundreds of different groups with quite different goals hammer out messy but functional agreements. And it wasn't just Los Angeles. She knew of other examples all around the world that didn't require Hardin's black and white solutions. The first problem with Hardin's example was the assumption that the land was a free-for-all. In the real world, it wouldn't be. In the real world, without owning the land, the farmers would likely treat it as something owned and managed by the community. The herders would most likely be neighbours who transact with each other in many different ways every day. In this type of situation, they would negotiate with each other, set their own rules and police them as a community. Now this is not to deny the tragedy of the commons altogether. Hardin's analysis can apply in other situations, but the existence of good counterexamples should make us hesitate before accepting the argument that the tragedy is unavoidable. Lynn Ostrom knew that there was nothing inevitable in these situations. The tragedy of the commons wasn't a tragedy at all. It was a problem, and problems often have solutions. Now, common pool resources, like Hardin described, can be found all around the world, from the high meadows of Switzerland to the lobster fisheries of Maine. Hardin's article assumed that all commons were identical, but Ostrom's research showed that they aren't. 
As Ostrom and her colleagues at the University of Indiana began their research into common pool resources, they discovered more than a thousand different examples and began to catalogue them, seeking to explain the difference between the successful attempts to manage resources and the failures. There were the Swiss farmers who had a system of rules, fines and local associations that dated from the 13th century to govern the use of scarce alpine pastures. There were the Turkish fishermen who took part in a lottery every September for fishing rights. In one study of irrigation systems in Nepal, she found that the systems built and governed by local farmers tended to outperform the much more expensive and sophisticated government-managed ones that were constructed using donor financing. Even though the engineering and construction of the government systems was far superior, the people overseeing them lacked understanding of the intricate web of incentives facing the local community. Over time, Ostrom developed a set of what she called design principles for managing common resources, drawn from what worked in the real world. She argued that these arrangements were rarely designed or imposed from the top down. They usually evolved from the bottom up. Ostrom's entire body of work is about social norms and what causes people to come together and cooperate. The principles she found included effective monitoring, graduated sanctions for those who break rules, and cheap access to conflict resolution mechanisms. Ostrom wanted to be as precise as she could be in her research, but there were limits as to how general the solutions she found could be. Lynn's only golden rule about common pool resources was that there are no panaceas. Now, Hardin's 1968 essay had a good title and illustrated a problem well, but his overall solutions are a bit of a shock and his policy proposals are extreme. He believed that the ultimate tragedy of the commons was overpopulation, and the central policy conclusion of the article was freedom to breed is intolerable. That's a quote. In a follow-up piece written in 1974, he advocated a lifeboat ethic of denying food aid to starving people in Ethiopia, as this would only make the real problem worse, the real problem being overpopulation. The logic of the tragedy of the commons was helpful in framing a type of problem, but once the problem was framed, Hardin then leapt to drastic conclusions without looking at how other similar problems were being solved by communities all over the world. Hardin's focus on overpopulation has not stood the test of time. Birth rates have fallen dramatically since the paper was written, and while the global population has grown significantly, the number of people living in extreme poverty around the world has almost quartered since 1968. In the longer term, it's been found that as countries get richer, they begin to clean up and take better care of their natural environments. Barbara Allen, a professor at Carleton College, tells the story of the time in 1976 when the Ostroms invited Hardin to dinner with a group of students at Indiana University. She recalls that the conversation over dinner was vigorous as Hardin laid out his ideas for government-led initiatives to reduce the birth rate in the United States, while Lynn and Vincent Ostrom worried about the unintended consequences of such top-down solutions. In 2009, Lynn Ostrom was the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in Economics for her analysis of economic governance, especially the commons. She passed away in 2012. Some of her most recent research addressed the problems of pollution and climate change. A lot of the environmental efforts focus on establishing government-led global agreements, and Ostrom argued that top-down approaches might not be the best solution. Common pool problems, according to her research, are often too complex to solve from the top down. A polycentric approach is necessary, where people develop ideas and enforce behavior at a community, city, national and regional level. The idea being that it's important for everyone to contribute. So why am I telling you all of this? Well, I was contacted a few weeks ago by a guy named Jimmy. And he said, Two years ago, we raised $20 million to plant 20 million trees. That's right. I said, nice job, Jimmy, but there's no need to shout. Anyhow, 
Jimmy told me that he has a YouTube channel called Mr. Beast, and that he's now trying to raise 30 million dollars in order to remove 30 million pounds of plastic waste from the oceans. He said that if I helped out he would send me a free hoodie to wear in my videos. I said it's nice to meet you Jimmy Beast, but you clearly haven't seen my videos. I can't tell you how off-brand it would be for me to wear a hoodie. And he said, well, my name isn't Mr. Beast, that's my channel name. And so I told him that maybe he should sort out his channel name if he wants to have any success here on YouTube. There was a long awkward pause and then he brought up that Ireland's most respected YouTuber, Nico, is going to dye his hair green for the day. And I said, look, Jimmy Beast, I get it. You haven't watched my videos. But I am excited to hear that YouTube influencers are working together to raise money for something that isn't a crypto scam, so count me in. And that's how today's video links in. The problem of plastic trash in the ocean is a huge problem, and it's a common pool problem like we just described. The best research seems to show that these problems are not solved by a top-down approach, but by lots of small communities of concerned individuals. And YouTube is a worldwide community of both creators and viewers. The takeaway from today's video is that when we're faced with big problems, it's easy to be fatalistic and say that nothing can be done, but actually great things can be done when people work together with their own self-interest in mind and contribute towards solutions that benefit us all. To raise $30 million, you need a lot of friends in your corner. Go Team Seas! Look at this. Is this where trash goes? No. Let's do this. We're saving the oceans in two ways. Brilliant. All aboard Team Seas. I don't know if you realize, we can do this. I'm stoked. Let's clean the oceans. Let's do it all together. I'm excited for Team Seas. So Jimmy Beast and a bunch of other YouTubers have apparently spent the last eight months working with the most trusted non-profit ocean cleanup organizations. The plan is to clean up the beaches, rivers and oceans across the planet. Half of the money raised will go to the Ocean Conservancy to organise massive volunteer beach cleanups, as well as going out to sea to clean up the existing mess. The other half will be spent on cleaning the rivers, as 80% of the plastic that gets into the ocean comes from 1% of the rivers in the world. So if this is something you care about, Go to teamseas.org to see how you can help out and to track the progress of the project. Have a great weekend and see you later. Bye.